Oh gang, I hope you are all doing well today and hope everyone got through unit one okay. We're now looking at chapter three for the beginning of unit two and we'll be looking at a historical overview of the U.S. healthcare delivery system. And so this presentation is about 40 slides and because of my great love for you, I'm going to try and make this uh, presentation less than 20 minutes. I will say this is an optional presentation. Remember the textbook is always going to be your primary source of information, but I know that many of us are auditory learners. I also know that there are several writing assignments with case studies and interactive posts and sometimes uh, hearing someone talk can help you to generate ideas for those writings. And so that being said, here we go. All right, so as you should have read in the previous chapters, the U.S. healthcare system is very different from healthcare systems around the world. It is a very private industry, um, whereas others are primarily government driven. But at the same time, the U.S. healthcare system does receive a large amount of money through the government. And so there are various uh, historical factors that are the cause for that that have shaped the U.S. healthcare delivery system. And there's a really good uh, picture in your textbook on Exhibit 3.1 that kind of helps better to tell the story. And so if you look at the history of the U.S. healthcare delivery system, there are many moments uh, and pieces of legislation and historical events that have shaped the healthcare system, one of those being the Affordable Care Act, also obviously social, political, and economic forces uh, which lead to compromises and change, and then over time, since the beginning, um, medical practice has become more and more specialized. It started very, very generalized. In fact, we had some of the worst education in the world to now having arguably the best education in the world, but also one could probably argue almost too specialized. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. And so if we were to kind of break down the evolution of the U.S. healthcare delivery system into four distinct time periods, they would be the pre-industrial era, there would be the post-industrial era, the corporate era or the corporatization era, and then the era of health reform, which the author argues, and I would believe is still very much in its infancy, and this is what you and I are seeing today. And so let's look at the first one. Let's look at medical services in the pre-industrial um, America. Um, this is more of the culture and ethic and mores. A strong domestic character uh, definitely was a shaper in uh, what healthcare was as that time. Um, healthcare services are very primitive. There's no healthcare insurance. You know that's why the barber shop is white and red because they had a blade, and so people would not just go to the barber for a haircut, but they'd also go to get procedures done. And germ theory wasn't quite evolved. And so literally it was very, very primitive. And we were very much behind uh, Europe during this pre-industrial America time period. And so I love exhibit three too. I think this is really good. Um, this is a really nice, concise review of what healthcare delivery did look like in this time period. And I would definitely uh, use this summary and keep this handy when you are studying for your uh, midterm examination. It's just really great to understand. And quite honestly, a lot of people who are in healthcare today don't even know this. And so I uh, personally, I just find it fascinating. All right, so what was medical training like in this period? Well, up until about 1870, medical training was really received through an individual apprenticeship, right? So you wanted to be a doctor, you got you got some books and you found someone else who was a doctor and you just worked with him. And uh, you didn't get a piece of paper, you just, when you were done, you just said, you know what, I'm a doctor. And boom, you were a doctor. And so this was done mainly out of necessity, you know, think about the westward expansion of the United States. Usually when there's expansion, it's really hard for healthcare to keep up with it. But pretty soon... Um, Americans began opening up medical schools and of course over time the requirements became uh, greater and greater and greater and over time as the uh, number of medical schools began to increase the quality of education began also to increase as well as its standards but early on 
uh, medical education was very much lacking in its standards and its in and in its understanding of a lot of basic science. So at that time, medical practice was a trade, right? Think of like a blacksmith or a leather worker. It was not very prestigious like it is today. There was no rigorous study, uh, no rigorous uh, clinical practice. There's absolutely no licensing. Um, anyone absolutely could decide to be a physician if they wanted to, which made it very competitive, uh, probably more uh, relational than skill set based. And as I said earlier, medical procedures were very, very primitive and um, very inhumane, especially when you're looking at the procedures that they did, like with lobotomies for patients who were dealing with mental illness. It's very, very common for clergy um, to also be considered physicians at the same time. In fact, uh, hospitals were born out of the church. That's why we see many um, hospitals today affiliated with the church, such as Christus in East Texas, or Houston Methodist, or many other hospitals. Um, many physicians who were not clergy also had a second occupation, so it's very common for physicians to be bivocational, quite honestly, because um, a physician could not live off of what they earned being a physician. So often they were butchers or barbers, or other things where they had familiarity with cutting tools. And so just remember, is during this time period where there's a strong spirit of self-reliance, right? Rural America. And so a lot of people didn't even see physicians. They would just either tough it out or they just deal with it themselves. And so that also led to uh, physicians not seeing as many people as they do today, right? Today, people get a cough, boom, they're going to see their physician. So a very different world. So medical institutions, like I said earlier, hospitals were very few, and the ones that did exist, quite honestly, you, you could sometimes get sicker if you went into them. They had very uh, deplorable sanitary conditions, very poor ventilation. Uh, the textbook talks about what were almshouses, also known as the poorhouse. And this is kind of the genesis or uh, hospitals in its infancy. They were the forerunner to modern hospitals and nursing homes, but they uh, honestly were not in great conditions. And often were used just to keep those people in society that did not want to be seen by society. And of course we had the asylum. This was the forerunner to modern inpatient psych facilities, those with severe mental health issues like schizophrenia, uh, you know, mania, bipolar disorders. Um, there are pest houses. As again, as I mentioned earlier, these are operated to isolate people, uh, particularly those who had contagious diseases um, infectious disease had not advanced to the level that it had now, so there are many diseases during that time, which today we just take an antibiotic and they're gone, but that was not the case then. So the pest houses were used to control people who had those bacterial infections and highly infectious diseases. And then there were dispensaries. These were staffed by medical students or apprentices, people who are learning the trade, and were established as outpatient clinics in order to provide free care. All right, so let's look at medical services in the post-industrial America. During this time period, we see the growth and the development of a more advanced medical profession. We start seeing the formation of more professional organizations, and then we start seeing private practice come into play. So just like the last exhibit, I think this is another one that I would definitely keep handy and I would study. But This really talks about the primarily uh, notable developments during this post-industrial era. A uh, lot of changes during this time period. You see, for example, on the bottom, the creation of Medicare and Medicaid. You see uh, in the middle that medicine starts becoming more organized. Above that, you start seeing that medical education is reformed. So there's really a lot of significant changes and a lot of advancement during post-industrial America. So what did the medical profession look like? Well, uh, instead of being more rural, it started to uh, become more urbanized, and at the same time, um, instead of making house calls like they do on Little House of the Prairie, they started actually having private practices in their own buildings. Uh, medicine became driven by actual science and technology and um, started to be more specified and more respected. So it wasn't like it was earlier where any lay person could just pick it up and become a doctor. That was no longer the case during this time period. It's also concurrently during this time period where lots of medical discoveries like understanding germ theory and things of that nature begin to evolve 
and really started to legitimize the medical profession. And so uh, lots of change during this time period. Um, here's some other um, examples of groundbreaking medical discoveries in addition to the germ theory I just mentioned. So take a look at these. Um, penicillin, that's for infectious disease that really cured a lot of problems and made people um, realize that, hey, maybe there's something to this medicine thing and maybe we should respect um, these doctors. And so because of this, we see the uh, formation of the first American medical organizations, the AMA, the American Medical Association, which still exists today. And this really galvanized uh, medical professionals, uh, particularly physicians, and protected their interest and really kind of became the uh, foundation and the playbook for future organized medical associations. Here's where we start seeing some reform in educational standards in universities. Um, we started seeing affiliations, we started seeing associations. Harvard really did revolutionize the medical education model and started uh, following what worked well in Europe. And so we see here the, the changes and increases in the education and schooling that was required to become a physician. Secondly, we have John Hopkins University, which also became a leader in the medical profession. And then we see the Council on Medical Education created by the AMA, and this led to the accreditation of medical schools. And this is a really good thing because uh, now not everyone could get in. You had to be serious. You had to be academically rigorous. You had to prove that in order to get into medical school. And this increased the quality of physicians. So at this time period that we also saw the development of hospitals. Uh, hospitals really started to grow. They started to become more of an institution. They started to become more symbols of healthcare. Um, they were able to leverage all these previous advancements in medical science that we talked about. And so, of course, you needed to centralize this technology and this science. And so facilities became more expensive and more institutionalized. So we start seeing also um, a reform in mental health care. Instead of locking people up in asylums and doing lobotomies, we start seeing legislation and federal policy being done in order to promote education, research, and humane treatment in psychiatry. And it's really sad to say this, but really a lot of these better reforms and better laws really didn't kick in until the 1960s. So it's really only been in the past 50 years that we've really deinstitutionalized and started taking better care of people dealing with uh, mental health challenges. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the history of health insurance. Um, private health insurance uh, was initially called voluntary health insurance. Most people just call it private health insurance today. And of course, we also have publicly financed Medicare and Medicaid patients. These are used to meet the medical needs of the elderly and the poor. So Medicare would be for the elderly and Medicaid would be for those who are qualified as poor. We also have workers' compensation. This is the first time there's a broad type of health insurance in the United States. This was um, originally designed to make payments for people who lost wages because of a job related injury. So maybe think during that time period of someone working on a dock on the East Coast and a bunch of crates fall on them and they can't work. You know, during that time period, if you couldn't work for a week, uh, you could be out on the street. And so they wanted to prevent that from happening. We also see the emergence and rise of private health insurance during the 1900s as medical treatments and hospital care became more advanced, right? The procedures, the technology, the care being provided became more expensive, and so uh, we need to figure out a better way in order to provide health care for people so that we could give this technology and these resources to people who needed them. And so it's during this time period that we also see the birth of Blue Cross, which is still in existence today. We have a time period where the Great Depression in the 1920s made hospitals really unstable due to economics and the spread of disease and the increase of poverty. And very interesting for those of you are, who are in the Texas area, it's in 1929 where the first insurance plan began, and that was actually done at Baylor University Hospital in Dallas, which is now known as Baylor Salmons. 
and it became a model for Blue Cross Blue Shield and for their plans all across the country. So a fun piece of local trivia there as well. All right, so in 1939, California has the California Medical Association, and so they, far, they started the first Blue Shield plan. This was designed to help pay their physician fees. And then in 1974, we see Blue Cross Blue Shield officially emerging. So we see Blue Cross becoming Blue Cross Blue Shield, which today is a joint corporation, and it has a presence in, I would say, almost every single state. And so during World War II, employees uh, began to accept employer-paid health insurance to compensate for the loss of raises. So we have employment-based health insurance, and still today, that is part of a very competitive package that uh, big employers will offer in order to lure the best candidates is by offering the best insurance. And so that is still a competitive, uh, a competitive element in the marketplace today. In 1948, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that employee benefits were a legitimate part of union management negotiations, thus increasing the provision of employment-based health insurance for employers. And then in 1954, Congress made um, employer-provided health coverage non-taxable, which is a great benefit for those of us who do have the privilege of having that. Great um, image here on Exhibit 3.5 for National Health Insurance. This talks about the reasons why NHI or National Health Insurance, which we've talked about in previous chapters, has really historically failed in the United States, and it's very cultural. And so make sure you take a, a look at this. I would say still today, while we are moving closer toward socialized medicine, it is still uh, we still see lots of resistance to that in America, and many of these uh, historical reasons still exist today. And so let's talk briefly about the creation of Medicare and Medicaid. Before 1965, uh, health insurance was only, uh, or rather private health insurance was the only widely available source of payment for health care. And so there were problems when people retired or problems when people experienced poverty. How could we take care of those people? And so through legislation, uh, programs were designed to help take care of these individuals in unique situations due to aging and or poverty. And so we have Part A, which is a subset of Medicare designed to use Social Security funds to pay for hospital care. So A is for hospital. B is designed to pay for physician services. And then we have Part D, which is not on the slide for some reason, but that is done to pay for uh, pharmaceutical products and prescriptions. Also remember, patients can be what they call medi medi they can be medicaid and medicare so you can have someone experiencing poverty and be over the age of 65 and they can get the benefit of both as well and so these benefits vary from state to state especially after the affordable care act was passed they actually vary even more so due to some states accepting certain parts of obamacare and some states not accepting it um, but the standards are uniform nationally for Medicare, being that it covers anyone over the age of 65. And Medicaid is also uniform in that it is means tested. Nice summary on Exhibit 3.6. I would definitely use this to study and keep this handy, but it really does a great job of differentiating between Medicare and Medicaid. So a really great distinction between the two on that exhibit. Obviously, these are going to be financed by the government, which is financed through your taxes. So if you look at your payroll check, you will see that you're just getting back what you initially paid for. Some of us more than others and some of us less than others. And so now we have the next phase, the corporatization of healthcare. And so as institutions rise, as we have become more global, as costs increase, as there are more middlemen, uh, we see corporatization and integration being a necessity in order to provide services and minimize costs. We also see that managed care or MCOs, managed care organizations, have now become their primary vehicle for delivering and providing insurance. And they provide uh, consolidation and purchasing power, which we can also benefit from. And then we also see at the same time consolidation in healthcare providers as they are consolidating from private practices into larger group practices and hospital associations and affiliations as well. 
Information uh, technology is also contributing to the advancement of healthcare, but at the same time also contributing to the cost of healthcare. Though telemedicine, in some ways, has reduced the cost sometimes in some areas. Um, it was during COVID as well, an important note, that we saw an increase in telemedicine, and a lot of studies showed that for certain areas, uh, the standard of care actually remained the same. So many patients were able to get the same quality of care, but also reducing the cost at the same time. Then, of course, we have e-health, which is information and services being provided over the Internet. And, of course, consumers today always like to have information and the ability to make decisions. And so e-health is a way to empower consumers, which increases patient satisfaction. As I mentioned earlier, another factor contributing to the uh, corporatization and integration of healthcare is going to be globalization. Um, as we become more globalized, we become more integrated. And so there's cross country telemedicine. Uh, there's what they call medical tourism. Uh, I feel fairly certain this will be in your test, so know this term. But it's basically when you're just receiving healthcare from abroad, you're going to another country. Uh, there are many procedures and services in the United States that are much cheaper in other countries. And then there are many services and procedures in other countries like the UK that could be cheaper here. And so going abroad is called medical tourism. And of course, as we become more integrated, technology and healthcare companies are becoming globalized. And so we see foreign investment being done in specific healthcare enterprises. And this is affecting healthcare and integration as well. And of course, we see the migration of healthcare professionals. We see many healthcare professionals being educated in other countries at a much lower cost and in much less time that are equally uh, as competent, arguably sometimes more competent, and then coming to the U.S. to practice medicine, knowing that they will be able to earn a higher income here. All right, so the last era is the era of healthcare reform, which the author argues we are in its infancy stages, and I think that probably could be true. And so healthcare reform, that's when we're starting to see major changes undertaken by the government to expand health insurance to the uninsured and to regulate the financing and delivery of health care. And while the Affordable Care Act did expand somewhat to those who are uninsured, it certainly did not deliver on its promises as many people still remain uninsured today. And so in the health care reform process, we're starting to see an uptick in the number of regulations and pieces of legislation that are being made. We're starting to see the bureaucracy of medicine rapidly expand uh, thanks to government intervention, and we're starting to see more and more control of the government in various aspects of healthcare delivery. In fact, so much so that uh, very recently in this past month, several Fortune 500 healthcare companies are actually suing the government now because they believe that the government has overreached their control in certain aspects of healthcare delivery and that they're impeding on the free market system and uh, impeding on their ability to create and deliver new healthcare technologies uh, to basically help people not be sick. And so here, officially, we're talking about the Affordable Care Act, although you've heard me mention it several times already. This was probably the most sweeping reform since the Medicare and Medicaid creation in 1965. Um, at this time, it was a majority uh, Democratic Congress and so obviously that helped it to pass. Very controversial law still today. And so the Supreme Court did up, uphold um, the constitutionality of some of the law, but some of the law was also pushed back through um, executive privileges by former President Trump. And then there is an option left to each state to expand Medicaid. And so Texas is one of the states that decided to not expand Medicaid. Also, the Supreme Court ruled that the Affordable Care Act, which I will refer to as the ACA for the rest of this class, violated the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And so there are many um, uh, religious institutions where um, employees do not have to participate if they feel like it is a violation of their religious freedom. And the Supreme Court ruled that federal subsidies for the purchase of health insurance could not be restricted if a state did not want to establish its own exchange to do health insurance. And so while the Affordable Care Act did pass, many of it was repealed or at least dialed back by either the judicial branch or the executive branch, which makes sense. That's why we have three branches to have a balance of power. 
And so healthcare reform continues to be in a flux. It continues to be a hot topic. It'll be really interesting to see uh, how this is addressed during the upcoming debates. Uh, I might have to think about doing some extra credit on that. And so just take a look on the insights and opinions on that in the, your textbook. So in conclusion, the healthcare industry in the U.S. Uh, evolved from being really very primitive and very embarrassing uh, family-oriented craft to really the largest industry and the leader, uh, arguably, in the world. We see the corporatization or the corporate era of medical care delivery uh, being characterized uh, similar to that of a large corporation due to information growth, information technology revolution, and of course globalization. And then we see the era of healthcare reform, which we are in now being inaugurated by the Affordable Care Act. However, as we just said, there are certain laws and uh, balance of power and branches um, to make some minor tweaks to that. And so that's it, friends. Um, look forward to your writing assignments and uh, look forward to your feedback and know that I'll be praying for you and here to help you uh, when you need.